right, so um, what the next few weeks are going to do, we're going to, we're, we're gradually getting to what polynomials look like when you graph them. What are the two main types of polynomials that you have graphed before, not necessarily this year, but throughout the years? Okay, well, quadratics, which are parabolas, yeah. Linear. And? Linear. Lines. Well, linear functions, right, the, the word that you said, linear, what does that mean? What does it mean when you take polynomial is linear? The biggest exponent is to the first power, yeah. And even though Karen said parabola, I would first to it as quadratic because I realize a quadratic function looks like a parabola, but what does the adjective of quadratic mean? To the second power. Well, what's going to happen in the next few weeks, besides not wearing pretty big classes, would be that uh, we're going to see what, what graphs start to look like when the degree starts getting big. What happens on the third degree, and fourth degree, and fifth degree, and sixth degree. And what, what ends up happening is that um, we're, you're going to learn how to determine what happens at the ends of a function. What, what typically do you see at the ends of a function? What do you normally see at the ends? Because oh, okay. you don't have an infinite amount of space. Dots? What do you graph? What do you want to graph? Dots? Dreams? Somebody said it. I heard somebody said it. Yeah, I heard it. I heard it. I heard it. I heard it. We're, we're going to learn eventually. Uh, and, and, and it's actually it's called end behavior. Uh, we're going to learn eventually what happens with the arrows, where the arrow is facing. But then we're going to work our way in and see what's happening in between those arrows. Okay, specifically, um, how many times a function uh, touches the x-axis. A function can only touch the y-axis once. And if the y-axis is going to touch it once, why? Why can't a function only touch the y-axis once? Oh, you ruined it. I was going to give you a candy, you ruined it. No, no, I, 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 thank you, yeah. I said, I no, I said that. Why? Did you give it to her anyways? No. No, I said it first, though. No. I'll tell you what. You don't even like to. That's not an option. I said, I'll tell you what. Yeah. Don't do that. It's bad. Um, so, yeah, a, a function can't have more than one line intercept because you would fail the vertical line test, but it, it could have several x intercepts. And that's, and that's, and we're going to focus on that today, uh, and then eventually we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, turn the Okay. Now, because all this funky stuff starts happening in between uh, the arrows, you're going to see a word in the direction that you didn't see before, and that word is sketch. So instead of saying graph, it's going to say sketch a graph. What is that word in the class? It's like talking about sketch. It's like a formula. Less formal. Less precise, more explanation. It's like, hey, you know, we're, we don't really care too much about every single point being exactly where it's supposed to be, but um, certain key attributes still need to be, to be precise. But the rest of the graph can, you know, it doesn't have to make sense much. So, uh, and we'll get there gradually. Today we start off with something called the maintenance theorem, which should be a pretty simple lesson for a couple reasons. Number one, it is a very complex to begin with. Number two, you guys have the advantage that I've already seen it. You've already seen it. So some other kids might be seeing it for the first time. You've had it. What does it mean to evaluate a polynomial? Take guess. Take guess. When you evaluate a polynomial, this you've done, and this you've been doing since before I was in college. Break it down. Break it down. What'd you say? What'd you say? Well, yeah, I don't know if you knew that, that that's the most one of the things to say. Simplify, yeah. But it's more than just simplify. Like before you simplify, you got to do something else. Substitute. When you evaluate a polynomial, you are substituting in an input and then getting back an output. The, the misnomer is when somebody goes, oh, it needs to solve. Well, no, because it's not solved by isolation. We're not isolating anything. What we are doing once we substitute it, 
as Alexi said, uh, seven point. Do you keep the sweetest script or do you give it to Hannah? Oh, uh, because we yeah, those are keeper right here. Uh, now, the way that you are used to evaluating polynomials is by literally substituting fin, doing order of operations, which is where the simplification comes in, and seeing what you end up with at the end. <clears throat> We're going to learn a different way called remainder theorem. So now here's remainder theorem. And I, I'm not going to go over everything. You can read it in this. I'll just get on the key points. What's that look like there? It looks like long division. Okay. We don't really like long division, and we're not going to use long division. We could use long division, but there's no need to here. Um, we're going to have a circle around there. I said, Elie, hey, you wonder why they call it remainder theorem, right? That is the remainder. So we're going to learn um, an association with the remainder, like how that relates to the divisor. And we can use that as a shortcut. Not to divide. We will not be doing division today. Well, actually, I think I've had some examples like that. We transition. We're gonna like we're gonna see the division again, but we're not gonna actually be doing division. What's the alternative that we use along the division? Yeah. So we are gonna be doing synthetic division, but we're gonna be using synthetic division for another purpose. We're not gonna be using it to divide. I've even seen books before that they don't even call it synthetic division. Now they call it synthetic substitution. Same thing. Exact same thing. We're doing it for a different purpose. Okay. Um, instead of reading all this and spoiling the end, this is spoiler alert, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. Let's just get to an example. Now, this is something we already know how to do. You have already seen these types of problems. <coughs> Determine whether this is a factor of that. Would you agree with that? Would anybody, would anybody disagree with that? That we've already seen this. In the past, how have we done this? Well, yeah, well, I mean, you're supposed to do it long, you were assessed on long, but Papa Romero told you guys how to do it synthetically, correct? Okay, and let, let's, let's go that way now, because that's what we're headed to in the synthetic. If I were to do synthetic division, whatever would I put in the little uh, bracket? I would put a positive 3. Not a negative 3, I put a positive 3. Now we can go a little more in depth into that. Why is that, right? Um, actually, let me pull up on that. put a positive 3. I'm going to need, uh, on a third degree polynomial, how many numbers do I need to have? Four. And I do, but uh, remember that you might get a placeholder. Okay. Um, Anything clear so far for anybody? Okay, now we should know how to do this by now because I'm going to introduce it. One last thing I have to spend a lot of time on. Drop the 1, multiply 3, add negative 1, multiply negative 3, add negative 2, multiply negative 6, and 0. What ended up being my remainder? Yeah, my remainder ended up being zero. So if I wanted to just answer this question, which is, is x minus three a factor? Yes, the answer would be yes. Now watch this, ready? Forget about x minus three for a second. Let's take a, a look at this number here that's in the, in the little bracket. Let's take it back to the old school hash brown TPT and get that three, plug it into this function, and evaluate that with three. Go ahead and do it. Ready? Yes. Get a three, plug it in for all the x's, order of operations. you get? <gasps> zero. These coincidentally, what else do you see as zero? <laughs> see, because in order for x minus 3 to be a factor, right, that factor, remember we want to zero product property, okay, would have to lead 
to a zero of a function, it would have to lead to a root. I should be able, because that is a factor, to make x minus 3 equal to 0, which would mean that x possibly could be 3. That's the reason why we changed the sign. Now, really, what we're here to focus on is the fact that whether it's a factor or not, it doesn't even need to be a factor. Long story short, if you now eventually, if you want to evaluate a problem, if you want a shorter way of plugging in an input and getting an output, get whatever that input is, put it here, and the remainder is going to be the pool That's what it's going to do It's a shorter way of plugging a number in. We have one more that's structured this way. Have a factor. What number would we be putting in here? Negative one. one. Negative one. But really what we're leaving is we're just saying, hey, what would end up happening if I were to plug a negative one in there? And then well, I'll let you guys do that one on your own. Somebody tell me what we would get. Is that negative seven? Now look, to answer their question, is x plus 1 a factor? No. no, it's not. That has to do more with what we've learned before. But on a completely unrelated thing, this is just, oh, by the way, what? There's another use for this? What would happen if I plug a negative 1 into here? I would get negative 7. You want to take a, a second to try to do that and see what you get, or you're going to take my word for it? Eating some hot Cheetos. Same hot Cheetos. And now, so that, this is now the evolution of these problems. Now, we're not going to be given factors. We're just going to be told, hey, look, this is a polynomial. What do I get when I plug in this number? And, and I need to emphasize this because what ends up happening, especially if you're kind of half paying attention and not half paying attention, you are programmed. Oh, I see a one there, but hey, I saw a one here, so I changed the sign. So they were giving you a factor. So really, by changing the sign, that's what I was telling you that you were turning a factor into a root, into a solution, so like a value of x. Here, they're already giving you the value of x. If you're going to use synthetic substitution, what number would you put in the box? Yeah, just leave it as a three. What's different about the polynomial though? Yeah, we're gonna need placeholders. Yeah, we're gonna need placeholders, but on fifth degree, how many terms do you need? Yes. I need six, and I only got four. So let's see. I got a fifth degree, that's good. Do I have a fourth degree? No, it's a placeholder. I have a third degree. I have a second degree, but I don't have a first degree. I don't have a constant. Another common mistake here would be when people don't see a constant, just don't write anything. Come on, if you don't have a constant, you still have to write a zero with a constant as well. Ready, set, go. What would happen if I were to get 3 and plug it in for x? What would be the output? Yeah, 1 in. The value of this polynomial with an input of 3 is 182. If you want to go do it the long way again, because you still waiting for your aha moment, be my guest. Play golf. Yeah. Huh? Coach, 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 co
No. And it doesn't like quitters. Uh, the x-axis 
And what causes that is a concept known as multiplicity. When you look at a polynomial in factor form, so far all the polynomials that we've been looking at have been in what form? Standard form. But if you look at a polynomial in factor form, okay, factors are usually denoted by parentheses unless you have just a single x. Uh, not only do when you have parentheses, that parentheses or that factor could have an exponent. That exponent is referred to as the multiplicity of the zero that comes from that factor. What do I mean by that? So let's say we were looking for x-intercepts. So that's what we were just doing, right? We were just looking for x-intercepts. Well, you know. Uh, I'll leave the ones where we ended up with a zero. We're looking for x intercepts. But um, if this y was zero, okay, what happens on the x axis? Y is zero on the x axis. Based on it being in fact the form, the little product property that we know already, what, what would be one place to touch the x axis? Zero product property. What would be one place that this touches? Huh? Well, x equals 5 might be the more obvious one that's really hard to remember, but also x equals 0. X equals 0. Right? <laughs> what degree is that following you? Yeah, since it's in factor form, you actually have to add the x when it's 6 degrees. I know you don't see the 6, but if you were to simplify, you would see the 6 degree, right? Uh, that 6 degree is coming from two different exponents, from a square and a 4. We're about to learn something called the fundamental theorem of algebra. It's coming up on one of the slides, which says that a, um, a function should have as many complex groups as its degree. So, this year, you would think, well, hey, this should have six solutions because it's six degree. But it, it doesn't because of the fact that we have repeated factors. And based on how many times a factor repeats, that's, that's what would um, tell you what happens at these x intercepts. So that repetition, so like here, how many times is this root repeated? Even though it only counts as one solution, how many times is it repeated? Twice. That, that's what multiplicity is. So this solution, this x-intercept, this root, this zero, has a multiplicity of two. What's the multiplicity of the next uh, root? Four. It's repeated four times. It has a multiplicity of four. And when that's significant is, like I said, what happens on the graph. And any time that a function has an even multiplicity, we're going to learn other aspects. We're going to learn what's happening. Don't worry so much about the arrows. Uh, don't even worry about whether it's like doing this from below or doing this from above. Just focus on, on the x-axis and the fact that uh, you see here at zero, which is what we said was going to be one of, the, uh, one of the solutions. Notice how we're touching the zero, but bouncing right back off. What is the turning point? Here at the 5, because the 4 is even, notice how we're touching, and then bouncing right back off. So it's just being That's why they say sketch. A lot of those sketches do not have to be exact anymore. No slope to guide you. There's no symmetry of a parabola to help guide you. So these are going to be sketches. You know, just kind of doing the building blocks now. Look at this next function. What, what's the degree of this next function? It is fourth degree, but that fourth degree comes from two unique factors. What would be the roots that come from these factors? Negative two and seven. But uh, in order to see what, like, to predict or determine what happens on a graph, we want to look at the multiplicity. What's the multiplicity of the negative two there? Three. Um, three, how about the seven? Four. What do one and three both have in common? They're 
odd, right? So if you have an odd multiplicity, what's going to happen is when you touch the x-axis, don't worry for now about whether you're, because normally when you look at a graph, you're looking at it from left to right. So don't worry so much right now that you're starting from below and going above, or going from above and then coming below. But the fact is when you have an, uh, an odd multiplicity, you go through the x-axis. You either start below and go above, or you start above and go below. Now the difference is, when the multiplicity is only one, which you could say is either divisible multiplicity, or divisible repeat, um, you're going to just go straight through. So like here, look at the 7. You see how the 7 has a multiplicity of 1? If you look here for where the 7 would be, I'm just going straight through. Well, over here on the, the negative 2, it was odd, but you see how it's greater than 1? What would happen here at negative 2, and it looks like this is starting from above, it's going down, going down, going down, going down, but before it gets there, it flattens out for a bit, and then it comes right back down. This is not my... Um, some of these slides, not all of them, some of these are mine, but some of these slides are borrowed. So I, I don't know why they had all these extra colors there. Just focus on what I have. Find the zeros and give their multiplicities. Okay. Zeros means how much of the x intercepts? What would be the x intercept here? X equals 2n. Two. Two what would be the multiplicity of the What would be the multiplicity of the 2? What would be the multiplicity of the negative 2? What would be the overall degree of the function? 18. This, this slide got kind of ruined. The answer already there. Um, so this is the same thing. Uh, the only thing is that they're asking you which one of these could it be. When we look at the multiple, let's look at the zeros. What what uh, what zero would come from this factor? X equals zero. What zero comes from the negative five? Oh, right. five and x is five. And the negative five. What comes from the last one? But now let's look at the multiplicities. What's the multiplicity here? What's, uh, what's the multiplicity of the next one? And then finally, three. So as Hannah was uh, saying, you can just like sketches. All these three possible choices are sketches because what don't you see there? Those are all numbers. It's all numbers. Even though there's no numbers, I still know what side of each axis is positive, which side is negative. Now, that's not to say that your graphs are never going to have numbers, but these are clearly sketches. Um, I guess, yeah, I didn't catch this when I began the slide. I, I didn't have a way to do this in there, but yeah, you can tell by the checks how the answer is there already. But let's just start with what appears to be the answer, which is going to be C. And let's just analyze why C is the answer. Okay? Because this is this first zero is on the negative side of the x-axis, which um, zero does that have to represent? The negative five. Yeah, we only have one negative zero. That would have to be the negative five. What's happening at that x-axis? It's bouncing off. Why is it bouncing off? It's, a, it's an even multiplicity. This zero here is zero itself. Okay, that's right at the origin. Not only why is it going through, but why is it going straight through? Because it's not only odd, it's one. Anytime it's a one, it just goes straight through. It doesn't, like, not that it turns, but it's bigger, it flattens out before it goes through. Right, each of five out of six, each of and then finally on the last one, this would have to be the 7. What's the multiplicity there? 3, which is odd, 
But notice how this graph is going up. It starts to flatten out a little bit, curvy, swirly, and then it goes up. Sometimes, um, as good as it is to look at it as an example of something, it's also good to look at counterexamples. So let's also look at the non-answers and see why the non-answers, right? This first one here would have to be the negative 5. And yes, I realize that this is an X there. We know that that can't be. But you know, why is it impossible for that to be the, uh, the negative 5? Yeah, it's not bouncing. It's going through. And you're right. The multiplicity of negative 5 is supposed to be even. It's not bouncing. This would have to be the 0. And what's wrong with that? That one is bouncing off. It's turning around. And it shouldn't be turning around because 0 is supposed to have a multiplicity of 1. And the last one is actually fine. This one here it would have been a seven. It's cool. It's uh, it's going through. It's also flattening out a little bit, but the other two still look for everybody. How about B? This one here you know, on this sketch that would have been a negative five. What's wrong there? It's going through, but negative five was supposed to bounce. This is a good one here. What's wrong with that one? Supposed to go through. Odd. It's flattening out as it's getting closer. It starts to flatten out a bit, and then it goes through. If it's all one, it should just go through. Don't be a little bit of a curve to it, but not nothing that that severe where it's kind of just flattening. And then finally, the last one. What's wrong with the uh, what's wrong with the seven? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm borrow the slides, and I guess I, I, I guess I can kind of tell what they were going for here. The person that wrote this, they were trying, I guess, to say, um, you know, it looks like the graph was the question, and then these are the answers. But you know, what what I would, what I feel could be disproved to you, like, see. And we talk about counterexamples, right? So you know, can could I offer a counterexample that would make this wrong? Like here, at the at the origin, okay, fine. I, 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 I would I would agree with that too. You know, why why would that have a multiplicity of three? Because it's bouncing. But really, that's not. I mean, that could also have a multiplicity of four, multiplicity of six. It doesn't really say it has to be a two. Uh, but okay, fine. You know, um, it could be two. Uh, this one's pretty definite. Why would that have to be a one? A multiplicity of one. It's going very straight through. Uh, this one here is saying three. And I'm pretty sure I can come up with a counterexample, something that looks like that where it wouldn't be three. But it could. It definitely could be three. It is flattening out, but what else could it probably be? Hmm? Not six. Oh, five. Yeah, it could be five. It might even be seven. Um, and you know, same here with the even one, that could be a two, could be a four. But fine, if we accept that these are all true, and the first one is three, and the second one is two, and the first one is, uh, sorry, the third one is one and two, um, you could also determine the degree of the polynomial by adding those up. What is three plus two plus one plus two? Eight, I think. That's going to eventually be important when it comes to determining what the arrow is. Uh, we have another one that's kind of like that here. Again, I have, so we might be able to come up with some counterexamples, but regardless, let's just take a look at this. This one says two. Why is it two? Well, now we want to understand when it comes to the x axis, it comes back from where it came. And then why is this one three? It, it is going through, but it's also flat as it goes through. Um, I could make the argument that this could be anything four, six, eight. This could be three, five, or seven. But if you take it for what it's at, what is two plus three? And that that has ramifications when it comes to figuring out eventually, which will be next week, what's happening to the arrows. All right, this is a biggie. Uh, in my opinion, I don't, I don't think we can stress this enough. We're, we're going by what the AKS says. 
and I was more than supposed to teach you. And I wish this was stressed a little bit more. This guy has a big one. But whatever, we'll go over it to the degree, no pun intended, um, that they want it to be. So what this says is that if I have a polynomial function, okay, I should have as many complex roots. We should know what, what does root mean? A could mean solution? X intercept? Zero, yeah. So the big one being the X intercept, but this is the word I want to focus on complex. If a number is complex, what could it be? It could be rational, that's one possibility. It could be imaginary, that would be the more obvious one I think for the guy, but or one more. Rational. Imaginary or, or real real encompassing is rational. There, there you are. Irrational. Both irrational and rational both are real. Um and so you would have as many complex roots as your degree. So like on the one that we just saw that was 18th degree. That means that that should have 18 roots, but 18 complex roots. That includes imaginary. If you have any imaginary roots, you wouldn't see them. They wouldn't actually touch the x-axis. Okay, they wouldn't be there. But you know, if, when if you were to solve it, you would see them. Another thing to learn, and this is not written down, so if you're still awake, you're gonna want to write this down. This is called contrary. <laughs> Root again means solution. Conjugate, you should have learned from before what, what's a simple way of explaining a conjugate. Yeah, change the sign basically, sure. So now what you want to pay attention to is that this theorem only applies to imaginary and irrational. Even though imag imaginary and irrational are not the same, irrational falls under real. Uh, like an irrational root, you would see on graph. It would just see x-axis. You'd see it. You can't see imaginary ones. And you can't see irrational, but the same theorem applies to both of them. And that says that if, if on that 18th degree uh, polynomial, if, the, if, if, if that has any irrational or imaginary roots, they have to come in pairs. You can't have a function that has five imaginary solutions. It has to come in even amounts. And, and, and not only even amounts, they have to be conjugates of each other. So if I tell you that an equation has a solution of 3i, it also has to have a solution of negative 3i. If, if, if an equation has a solution of negative uh, square root of 5, we also have to have a solution of positive square root of 5. And where do you think that comes from? Where do you think that would come from? Why, why do you think that this is true? Well, why, why, why wouldn't they have to come in contact with it? What causes both imaginary and irrational numbers? Uh, square root property. Square root property. What we're talking about square root property is that you in an equation. Some of these type of equations, no? Did it again? No, not from the plus or minus. Yeah, that's from the plus or minus. All right. So this uh, hand that you were asking me about what we're going to do tomorrow, it's kind of review. Like the rest of this packet is, is review. Um, we should be able to get through most of it. Um, I don't necessarily want to go straight in order because things start to get redundant. But I kind of want to jump around a little bit, and then if we have extra time. Uh, Tomorrow at the end, then we'll just recycle through and go back over the ones that we didn't do. So, like here, like on this first page, let's do the first two. Uh, I know it's in the last period we're comparing the part C. Okay, now this says x to the third times x plus one squared, and then x plus five over four. That's what the first one says. So, what they want you to do is state the degree. 
what is the degree of that function? It is 9, yeah. 3 plus 2 plus 4. That will have its implications once you get to study and be able to plug the arrows for it. Let's find the zeros. So, then, like now we've got to become experts at zero product property. Well, where would this specifically touch the x axis? At zero, yeah, because of this one. Where else? At negative one, yeah. And a negative one, yeah. And then state what the graph would do at each x intercept. Well, that has to be multiplicity. Well, what's the multiplicity here? Three. Three, good. What's the multiplicity of negative one? Two. Oh, geez. And then finally? Four. I'm not going to know it, so I'll translate this. What would happen uh, with a multiplicity of three? Yeah, it would, it would get flat, but then go through all usually abbreviated. Grammatically incorrect version of two, like when you go to a drive through you still don't want to write the same, but it's going flat and then come through. Jaden, um, how about the negative one? What would happen at negative one on the x axis? I see, that's the thing we haven't talked about whether it's going up or down. We haven't gotten to that. Let's see what. We're going to talk about the difference between when functions are increasing and decreasing, when functions are positive, when functions are negative. I haven't got to there. I wonder what's going to happen when we get there. It's going to bounce, yeah. It's going to bounce. We have an even more. Go ahead, Caroline, in the last one. Yeah. Bounce. I'm going to see if you can do this, but I'm going to do it simultaneously. Give me uh, the same thing the degree, the zeros, their multiplicities, and what that multiplicity means. And then we can compare and contrast. Any questions on number two? All right, so now, let's skip these next two and come back to them when we have extra time tomorrow. But if we get redundant, it's just the same thing we're just doing. And let's do five and six, and then we'll call it a day. Build the following. Build, 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 build a polynomial containing the following terms. Now, I wish it would have said polynomial function, but let's just make it a little bit anyways. If I were to have a 0 at 3, what factor could that have come from? Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to come from it, but it very well could come from x minus 3. And if it has a multiplicity of 2, second power. What factor could a 0 of negative 6 come from? x plus 
plus 6. Which factor could a 0 of 0 come from? Just as in the normal, it says we have to write it from the tail. What exponent should I have? Any questions? And then the last one, write the function in factor form for the following graph. We haven't learned all the attributes yet of a function, but um, and, and assume that this somehow connects down here and goes back up. So based on what we know, okay, we can definitely identify the zeros. So uh, where's the first place to touching the x-axis? Well, it's touching at negative one, which uh, would be uh, x plus one. It's also touching at zero, which would be an x. And then it's touching at three, which would be an x minus three. But how it touches is determined the multiplicity. What would be the multiplicity for the for the uh, the, the, the the x plus one? Yeah, it would, it would more than likely be two. I guess it could be any even number, but let's just think for argument's sake, this is not a super high degree, so I can say there's number two there because it's bouncing off. How about for the zero at the origin? It, it, well, no, it looks like it would also yeah, it would be some even number. To keep it simple, let's just say two, but I, I, I think it could very well be a four or six or anything, but let's just try to keep it to the lowest one possible. And then how about this last one over here, the three? Definitely wouldn't be one. Why would it not be one? Yeah, maybe it's hard to see, but it is kind of getting a little flat. It curls a little bit before it goes up. So it wouldn't be one. You know, we'll just put that it's three because that's the lowest one. But you know, maybe it's going to be five or seven. Yeah, because if it would have been a one, if it would have been a one, it wouldn't happen. If the line would have just... Like, it doesn't mean it has to be perfectly straight, like there could be some type of bend to it, but it doesn't do like that. It just kind of... Thank you. 